Hey, okay, welcome here. Uh, believe it or not, we're getting to the end of week number five, and we just have one more week here, not week six. And so, summer school always goes so quick. I, I hope you, you've been having a, a, a good time in this kind of uh, different uh, setting, um, and uh, we're making the, the best of it uh, that we can. But I uh, feel like, and I hope you do too, that the, the lessons are getting across to you, and we're uh, learning. And so, watching and grading your tests, and I'll say more about your tests here in just a second, um, uh, things seem to be going pretty good. So, this is day uh, 14. And uh, as you know, we were talking about uh, sound waves. Uh, it's the end of 16, so I kind of want to wrap up 16, and then we'll roll into 17. And then actually 17 and 18 go together. Uh, they're on waves again, but they're little different waves. They're electromagnetic waves, and they're, they're optics. And so we'll spend a lot of detailed time on our optics. So, so that's where we're headed, but I thought I would uh, pull up the, the schedule again, like I've done uh, the last few days, and I just want to keep doing it uh, to the end here. And so if I, if I hold up the, the schedule that's on the syllabus, we're right here, uh, June 17th. Um, we're a little behind in terms of the, 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 the original schedule. This has just been kind of a weird and crazy world we, we live in with all kinds of things going on on our campus and of course worldwide with the coronavirus. And so uh, things haven't flown as nicely as I would have hoped they, they would have. Um, no, but also, I, I, I think I've got a chance to dwell a little bit uh, deeper into some materials than I normally do, and they're just, they're just kind of a, a new teaching environment uh, uh, for me. But I'll say it again, um, keep in mind, the best thing we can do for this class, and have already done, is that chapters 1 through 8, to get you ready for Physics uh, 121. So I, I think you guys are there. This other stuff we're doing right now is stuff you'll see again in 123. So the, so the more we cover, the, the better, but we're going to see it all over again. And so uh, this stuff here is good to cover uh, because it gives you some uh, insight uh, coming up uh, later on. But anything we don't quite get to is, is actually okay because we will get to it uh, in 123. So you'll learn it. It's like I said, just kind of nice to see it a little bit ahead of time before those next semesters come. But the big thing is the immediately next semester, which for many of you and maybe most of you, it's next fall uh, because that's where you're going to get into 121. And so you've got to get through that class before you can get to 122 and then 123. Oh, actually in your guys' case, if you go to 121 in the fall, uh, you would go into 123 in the spring and then 122 in the fall. So you do it a little bit out of a numerical order. And so uh, maybe this would be a good time to say, I don't think I've ever uh, said it uh, to you guys, but when you're making your schedule for, for uh, future semesters, keep in mind uh, that 121 is taught every semester, uh, fall and spring, not summer. Um, but 122 is only in the fall and 123 is only in the, in the spring. So you'll take 121, you know, whenever you finish your math and your physics. Uh, some of you, that would mean this fall. For others of you, that will probably mean next spring. Uh, and then the next semester, you go into 121. Whether, whether that's spring or fall semester, you take 121. Then your next class will be either 122 or 123, depending on what semester it is. And so that's keep it, keep in mind, uh, 122 is only in the fall and 123 is only in the spring. Well, I'm glad I remembered that. That wasn't the main announcement I wanted to make, so let's just come back here. But, but here we are at the end of week five, and so we have in front of us the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then when we come back, everything goes really, really quick. Uh, we have a, a regular class lecture on the Monday, but then on Tuesday we have test number three, followed by one lecture, and then a final on Wednesday. And so one week from today, at this time, you will be sitting down and taking the final exam. Now, the day before, you would have already taken test three, and now you'd be taking the final exam. So one week from today, you'll be done. So let me say it again. I think the best advice I can give you is this, this weekend, this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you go back and you not only do the chapters that we are done since the last test, uh, which isn't that much. It's just uh, the 15 and 16 and what we do today, which would be probably most of 17. 
You do those, you do the homework, you do all the labs, but you also go back and start reviewing because remember your final is on, on, on Wednesday. And so once Monday hits, you'll have new material on Monday, you'll have a lab to do on Monday, so you'll have a homework, you'll have some learning to do, uh, then you have to get ready for that test on Tuesday, then you got more learning to do, only to get ready for the final exam. So do yourself, I think, a tremendous a favor and don't overwhelm yourself all trying to learn this, say, Monday or Tuesday night. It, it'll just be too much. And so make sure that you do a lot of study and a lot of review. And like I said, if right now your calendar is full with some event, there's any way you can just, you know, pass that off, knowing that after Wednesday, after Wednesday at 2 o'clock, you'll be done with the final, and then you can make up a... a, a, a a job schedule that you swapped with somebody and say, hey, look, I'll cover your shift. You cover, if I can, I'll do a double shift for you next Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, um, whatever it takes. Or if you have some obligation and say, I'll, if I'll just, if I could just hold off this obligation this Saturday, if I could just do it next Thursday. Uh, even if you're doing summer school two, remember summer school two will not start until that following Monday. So you won't have any homework after the final exam until uh, summer school two starts and so the, and of course if you don't have summer school two then you have uh, what is it six weeks no it must be more than that. I think seven weeks b before the start of the fall semester so anyways that's the schedule I want to keep repeating um, also I wanted to say a little bit about the exam you just took on uh, on Monday. Uh, I did get a chance last night to start grading it. I, I, I would say I got about half of you guys uh, graded, maybe a little short of a half, but somewhere close to that. And so things uh, are going along fine. And uh, later on this evening, I'll get back and continue on grading. I, I don't really see me completing it all tonight, but definitely tomorrow. And so check out your scores. And let me put some numbers here on the board. Uh, these are the same numbers um, I gave you at the end of, uh, or test number one. Um, but some magical numbers are real important here. Because if you're shooting for an A, a B, or a C in these class, these are the numbers that will indicate that. Uh, if you can get 86% or higher, and on average of all your exams, and that would be test one, two, three, and the final, then you'll get an A. Of course, I'm also assuming you've done all the labs and all the homework. And so I need to sit down and mark those in the grade book, but I'll tell you, those are just my, marked for completion. So even though I haven't marked them in the grade book, uh, I'll start doing that because I need to start processing all that to get ready to, to assign you a final grade. Uh, but I know from the math that if you do all the homeworks and labs, and so there you get 100% on those, and then on your test, and right now you have only have a one test as your score, but you're about to have a second one. I would encourage you to take your first test and your second test and average the two. Once you see your scores tomorrow, maybe noonish or something, take that score, and like I said, with test one, and average it, and, and see where you are. And if you're above 86%, I would say you're on a path for an A. Now, if you're below 86%, but above 73%, uh, you're on a path to a, a B grade. And if you're between 47% and 73%, uh, you're on a path to a C. And then, of course, if you're less than that, then you're on a path to a, a D or an F. But this will give you an idea where you are once you see the score from your second e exam. And then keep in mind, you still have a third exam and a final exam. And so you might think of it this way, that we're your grade is kind of halfway decided. And so you can go way up or way down. I hope you don't go way down. But you could hopefully go way up if your goal is still to go up because you've taken two tests and you have two more to, to take. And so those last two days here, test number three and the final exam is going to be equal and actually more because the final exam is a little bit more than a, than a, than a test. Um, and so you're... you're 
less than halfway really I'll call it halfway but it's really less than halfway so you could really change your overall grade by going up or, or going uh, down so so don't think that your grade is actually already decided uh, if you're doing well great keep it up but if you're not doing so well know this that you've got plenty of points out there to still go up we're getting now to the end of the class Our, we're, we're getting to the point in the class where we're kind of wrapping up the learning and now the verification or the test taking of what you've learned now begins to fall into place. And so that's why the last two days it really is over half of your, your grade. Sounds kind of scary, but it's normal and, and I think appropriate because that's when you finally have learned it. And so you, most of the beginning of the semester is all about the learning of it and the end of the semester is showing that you have learned it. And so the, the points are not equally distributed a, across a semester. The points are at the end of the semester. Okay, well, like I said, that's a little bit about the test. And then also, um, I got a, a few questions by email uh, last night uh, related to chapter uh, 15. And it actually has to do with numbers 24, although I think 25 fits right together with that. And so I thought I would start today's lecture then and say, okay, let's take a look at chapter 15 and I'll start with number 25. I think 25 is a little bit easier than 24. Doesn't surprise me that I got a bunch of emails. I know in the past uh, I would say number 24 um, out of this chapter 15 might be the hardest one to understand in terms of this 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 whole semester um, it's if, if this is not then the one that is is the one we're going to do today when we do a bunch of geometry or if we don't quite get it today on on Monday but I know that in the past uh, it's either been this issue or the geometry issue that comes up in our optics that has been the most challenging for for students in this semester here so uh, when I got a couple questions on this, it reminded me, oh yeah, yeah, I should say more about this one because this by far is going to have a lot of, uh, of questions. And also, I, I'll tell you, I was thinking this was actually more in chapter 16, so I was going to address it today anyways. I didn't quite get to it, but you'll see it ties really well with where we left off yesterday. Yesterday we were, you know, talking about this guitar and saying, okay, why does it produce these particular uh, waves? And we had that standing wave. And so to really understand this one, you kind of have to understand the standing waves, which, like I said, is why I was thinking it was in chapter 16. Now I'm kind of wondering why, why, why it is here in uh, chapter uh, 15. But anyways, uh, let's look at, at 15. So uh, if you got a moment, uh, Call up the PDF of your, of your book here. I'll, I'll read the uh, problem here, and it, it just says this. It says, what is the fundamental frequency of a four-meter rope that is tied at both ends if the speed of the wave is 20 meters per second? Now, before I answer it, I think the, the best thing is a visual effect again. So I'm going to come over here and try to show you then these waves on a string that would be tied on both ends. We called this a standing wave if you remember yesterday because what would happen is the wave would go down and reflect and come back and a pattern would develop where we would get this kind of this node. But what I need to emphasize so that we can do this problem is there are many, many, in fact technically infinite number of patterns that I can have where one end is tied and the other is tied. And that's what number 25 is saying. You have a rope that is four meters long and this is well, maybe a little more would be four meters. So this is really a, a good layout of this problem here. And so it's tied on both ends. 
and you might get a pattern like this. Now I want you to notice the pattern I have now is a little different than the one I had a moment ago. I would say right now, let me call it a pattern and give it a number three. And I say three because if you look at this, the standing wave has three humps in it. See, the one I had before only had two. Let me come back. The one I was showing you before looked like this. Two humps. But I could have any integer number of humps. How, how about four? Now four is a little harder to make. I'll give it a try here. Let's see. I'll have to go pretty fast. One, two, three, four. Okay, good. So there's four. I, I won't try five because I'm not sure I could do it, but if my hand could shake fast enough, I'd get five or six or seven or eight. Oh, let me show you one. One is uh, so boring that you almost kind of missed the pattern. That's why I didn't start with one. I started with two and then showed you three, went back to two, then showed you a four. But, but here's one. And so I hope you kind of see this pattern here. And so let me take the whiteboard here, and I guess I'll start here in the center and say, all right, if I had a string, or in this case a rope, and I tie it at both ends, that's the key to this problem. It is tied. Well, once it is tied, they can't move. Those would be nodes. The ends are nodes. And so a string then can have a lot of different patterns of how it shakes with the endpoints being tied. And so I will draw the one I showed first, which is two humps. Now again, the challenge of drawing something here on the board is you don't kind of see it go up and down, and so what we like to do is then draw what it might look like a moment later. And so this first hump would be up, and this one would be down in a moment later, and so in your mind, if you could imagine this thing moving, this is our standing wave. This is what I was saying in the last lecture, is a breathing pattern. Uh, then the other one I was showing you was three humps, so one, two, three, and so it would look like that at one moment in time. A little bit later in time, it would look like this. And so maybe at first these two are up and the middle one is down, and then a little bit later the two end ones go down and this one goes up. So again, it looks like it's, it's breathing. Uh, but I also showed you uh, four. And I'm hoping by the time I draw all four of them on here, you're, you're getting the idea that this could go on forever. And so there's four humps, and that's what it looks like at one moment in time. And a little bit later, it would look like that. So to label these, maybe I'll just say n equals to 2, n equals to 3, n equals to 4. And so we'll have something we can reference them. Now, the one I showed last, and the one that's a little bit harder to kind of even recognize that it's a wave, just because it doesn't have more than a one hump in it, and one hump is going to represent a half wavelength. I want to mention that in just a second. But it would look something like this, so let me call this an n equal 1. And that's really the key to number 25. Uh, and then number 25 is the key to the main question I'm trying to get at, which is number 24. But number 25, and of course, does he put a little triangle? Yeah, he does. So he puts a little triangle and says, hey, this is a hard one, both 24 and 25. But 24, like I said, a little easier than 25, I think, because this is the pattern they want you to, to, to recognize. If, if you then say that the string has a length of L, which in this problem, that's four meters, but I'll just call it L for right now. 
and maybe I'll change colors to make it stand out. Uh, maybe I'll look at n equal to 2 first. Let me just draw one wavelength in the green. And so wouldn't one wavelength go up, back down, and that would be one wavelength. In other words, one wavelength would be two humps, right? The, the part that goes up that we call the crest and the part that goes down that we call the trough. No, watch. Let me, let me see if I can highlight it here with this one, number three. It goes up and then down like that. Or maybe number four, what would be a wavelength right here? And so hopefully what you're seeing in this picture is that the wavelength then is really made of two humps. What I keep calling a hump, a wavelength is two humps. Or put another way, one hump is then a half wavelength. That's really the key. That's the key to the mathematics. Now, I'll put it up here on this first one. So this right here would really just represent a half wavelength. If the string was longer, it would go down and look like that. And so that's what a, a full wavelength would, would look like. So full, the wavelength would be actually longer than the length of the string. And maybe now you can begin to see the pattern. The pattern would, would look like this. Uh, maybe again, I'll start with, the, I think, the easiest one, the n equal to 2. Here, I would say L equals, and I would just say it's one wavelength. But let me say it's got two humps in it. So I would say it's two half wavelengths. Whereas down here, L has three humps in it. So it's three half wavelengths. On here, L would be four half wavelengths. Uh, up here, L would be just one half wavelength. And in fact, that you're beginning to see now a generalized pattern that L would equal to N half wavelengths. And so each hump one, two, three, and four would represent then a half wavelength. And so when they say in this problem, what kind of patterns can be formed? Let's see, how do they, how do they phrase it here? They say, what is the fun, well, they say, what is the fundamental frequency? Um, what is the fundamental frequency on a four meter rope that is tied on both ends? Uh, so they only ask for one of these, the fundamental one. So let me, let me define that here in just a second. But before I even do that, I can rearrange this to say, I can put the 2 over to here. I can then put the n also over here. And I get a nice little equation that says what wavelengths are possible in this condition. And, and when I say this condition, the condition is a rope that is tied on both ends. And so n then can be either a 1 or a 2 or a 3 or a 4 or any integer. And so you could say there's an infinite number of wavelengths, but I want to make sure you catch, I'm not saying every wavelength is possible. What I'm saying here is there's a lot of different wavelengths are possible. In fact, technically there's an infinite number of wavelengths that are possible. But if they are discrete. They are not you know, uh, 11 and then 11.1 and then 11.11 and then 11.1111. Those are not possible. They're integers. And so this integer then comes into play and tells us what wavelengths are possible. Now, number 25 used a word in here that's going to allow us to focus on one of them because it says here, uh, let's see, what is the fundamental frequency? And the meaning behind that fundamental one is the one that is the lowest frequency. Now, keep in mind that velocity equals wavelength times frequency. 
So when they're talking about the fundamental one, you can see in the math, they're talking about the longest wavelength one. The, the, the simplest one. That's why it's called the, the fundamental one. I'll come back to here. Any other frequency will be higher than that. And so if I grab this four meter long rope, if you will, and I just shake it at its lowest frequency, its fundamental frequency. So you only see one hump in it, right here. This is now at its fundamental. But as you can hopefully get out of this discussion, there are other frequencies and they would be integer multiples, that's where the N comes in. And so this is what we would call a second harmonic. It's not the fundamental one, it's the next one up. It's actually double the frequency of the one before. And of course, the other one I showed you was three humps, okay. So three humps would look something, there we go, something like that. And so I've got these three humps. Uh, this would be the third harmonic if we wanted to put a fancy word with it. And it would then be three times the frequency of the fundamental. Okay, so to answer number 25, 25 then, and so maybe I'll put a number here, number 25. When they say fundamental, they have just told me which one they're talking about. Of all these different patterns that are possible, okay, in other words, all these different integers n, the one they're asking for in number 25 is n equal to 1. So this would say that 2L over 1 is the wavelength. And of course, the L is the 4 meters. So, the first step in here is to realize that the wavelength is 8 meters. And maybe you can see it back here in this picture, right? This picture, if this is the length of the string, if this is the pattern, if this is 4 meters, then the whole wavelength is 8 meters. Even though you don't see the whole wavelength, you, you don't have a rope long enough to see the, the whole wavelength, it is 8 meters long. So once we know the wavelength, we can finish this problem with right here, which then what's the, the frequency? So the frequency is velocity divided by the wavelength. And I need to go back and look, but I think they said the velocity is 20. Yeah. And so if I then divide that by 8, uh, this goes into, let's see, 8, 16 and a half left over, so that's two and a half, uh, meters would cancel with meters, and now you have your one over second, which we called a hertz. So the frequency, the fundamental frequency would be two and a half hertz, and so if I was standing here, I would have to, you know, move my hand up and down two and a half times, so two and a half cycles, so if I started up, I'd go one, two, and down. I, would, I did that in one second, uh, that would represent the fundamental frequency for this particular rope, okay? So that's what they were after. Now, the real question then was number 24. So let me keep going because 24 is a lot like 25, but it's a little harder to visualize. And so that's why I thought it would be best to give you a visual picture of number 25 first because what I just showed you was a scenario where as I said the endpoints were nodes. I know they were nodes because they said they were tied but what if the end of the string wasn't tied? Well, that's not really possible with a string. You, you got to tie the string together. But I brought this wave machine out here today again uh, for exactly this purpose. <clears throat> if I were to make a pattern of standing wave with this machine, notice that the ends of them are not nodes. They're free to move. In other words, the ends are anti-nodes. 
So let's draw some more pictures. Let's do this. Let's say what patterns could you have for this wave machine? See, see, this is a little different question than the string. The string, they have to be nodes. This one, they can be anti-nodes, or they even have to be anti-nodes on the end. All right, so if I come over to here, and maybe I, you know, make a dotted line uh, to represent the length of those metal rods. And why don't I make four of them again, just like I did for the string. And I don't want to put a dot because I want to emphasize they're, they're not being tied, but maybe I'll put a, a vertical line then in blue. So this is the edge of it. But again, the rods at the end are not stationary. They're not nodes. They are free to move. So maybe just off to the side, I'm going to draw just in general the standing wave. And in the problem we just did, we said that, okay, you would have to draw it from a node to a node. But see, now I'm going to say, let's draw it from an anti-node to an anti-node. So maybe right here is an anti-node, and the next anti-node is here. And the next one is here. And the next one is here. And the next one is here. And so really this is the same question. What kind of patterns could I have where both ends are an anti-node? Instead of a node, an anti-node. And maybe I'll draw this one first because I think this one might be the, the easier one to see. This is going to be the n equal to 2 just like before. You'll, you'll see it here when I say, okay, so I'll draw an anti-node. And so that's here. It'll come down and have a node and curve around and have a node and then go back up to an anti-node. Okay. And of course, since it's a standing wave, it's kind of breathing. So if you'll let me draw the other half it'll look like a moment later, this would be the pattern. And like I said, I think this is a little bit harder to, to, to see here. But the reason I've called it two is because I've gone to the second antinode. In other words, I, stand, I, I started at an antinode. And I went one anti-node and another. So there's two anti-nodes in here from edge to edge. Now, with that being said, though, we could have a lot of patterns. Uh, we could have a three. Let's call this n equal to, to three. And so if you look closely at this, uh, maybe it would start here. And, uh, okay, maybe here. And so here's one, two, and three. And so it would look... Maybe something like this. It would come down, it'd go back up, and then it would come back down. And it would finish on an anti-node. And a moment later, this would come down to here, this would go up, this would come down, and this would go up. So it would look like that. And so again, I'm starting at an anti-node, going to another anti-node, an anti-node, and finishing at an anti-node. So in other words, both ends are anti-nodes. Uh, I could do the same kind of pattern, n equal to 4 here. And so n equal 4 looks like it would go, okay, down, one anti-node, back up, two, back down, three, back up, four. Okay, there's my four anti-nodes. And a moment later it would look like that. And again, I, I, I left off number one because it's the one that is probably the hardest one to see. It's just a drawing from here to here. And so it would be, okay, I start at an anti-node and I finish at the first anti-node. It's so short in the sense that it doesn't even represent a full wavelength, it's, it's hard to see that one. And of course, a moment later, this would come down and this would go up. All right, so let's come back to my machine here so you can see it better here. So if I come back over to here and let's see, maybe I'll try to make mode number one. Maybe I shouldn't have started there. But that's 
what we'd call n equal to 1, or mode number 1. It's, it's such a small piece of the wavelength, it's hard to even recognize the wavelength. Now maybe I'll go a little bit uh, faster here and see if we can get n equal to 2. So if I go up, down, up, down. I didn't get it very stable there. Ah, there we go. Now I'm finally getting it. So it's right about that rate. And so again, I think these are harder to see than the string. That's why I wanted to do number 25 first. Because this, if you can hopefully see an antinode in the middle, but I start here on an antinode and go to the second antinode. Now let me give that a chance to settle down and I'll try to show you three and four but really we could kind of do the same math if you call this L the length of your medium which in this case would be the rods uh, then and I'll maybe I'll start with the easier one to see L here and uh, this is a little little trickier here Let's see, from, from an anti-node to this node, that's a quarter of a wavelength. Uh, then this one hump, that's a, that's a half a wavelength. And then we have another quarter. In fact, if you look at all of these, there'll always be a quarter on each end. So, so that's, a, that's a half. And then how many a humps in it is another half. So in other words, this has two halves in it. It's, it's one full wavelength, right? It goes from crest to crest. It's, it's actually one full wavelength, but I'm going to write it as two half wavelengths so that I can see the pattern, and you'll see it down here. Um, again, I've got a quarter and a quarter, so that's a half, and then this is a half and a half. So half, half, and these two make a half. There's three halves here. So three half wavelengths. Uh, same thing with this one. i got a quarter on each side. Okay, there's a half, and then a half, a half, a half. There's four halves. And so L equals to four halves.